Hello guys, Winston here. It's been six months since I moved to California and my room is still a disaster, particularly my desk area because of the constraints of my room. My bed placement means that my desk has to be fairly shallow and my frugality and laziness means that I haven't invested much effort into maximizing the efficiency of my workspace. But today, I'm taking the first steps in dealing with some of that clutter and what I figured needs to go most urgently is my $100 monitor stand. This space that's occupied by the footprint of my monitor is perfect real estate for storing hard drives and mail that I'm never going to read and dongles. But right now it's wasted because it's filled with dead volume. So the plan is replace the books and elevate my monitor with a stand that I can slide things under. Now conceptually, that's something even I could do without a CNC using plywood power tools and really basic joinery. But where is the fun in that? I wanted something a little more stylish and minimal, and I had some ideas in my head, but I couldn't narrow them down. Then I saw Chris Salamone's aluminum and walnut side table, and I found out that I really liked that material combination. I wasn't a fan of the joinery methods and hard angles, but I liked his execution. So I decided that aluminum frames would be an integral part of my design aesthetic, and I would use walnut to fill out the rest of the volume. But because this small board of walnut that I grabbed at Ganals was all I had on hand, these frames would have to be spaced out to stretch the value of my lumber. To connect the frames, I would use quarter inch dowels. Any larger and I'd start to compromise the structure of my thin frames. But visually, a quarter inch rod isn't very impressive. So I'd use some spacers to help add some bulk between the frames and just make the whole thing a little shinier. One note here about the design, I'm not using a plain rounded corner on the outside profile of the frame. I'm using a spline which is loosely modeled after a conic curve. These curves often appear more natural or organic to the eye, and using them is a nice and easy way to push back against the stale aesthetic that the unimaginative engineering side of my brain would otherwise come up with. In terms of cam, things are dead easy for the wooden frames. Bore, contour, finish pass. And five times out of six, it worked out just fine. But one time, I didn't quite use enough double-sided tape under my part and one of the frames ended up moving on me. It got chewed up by the end mill pretty bad, though I managed to stop the shape oka before too much damage happened. And because I didn't have enough walnut to remake another frame, I had no choice but to try and repair this one. So my plan was to machine out part of another frame and then graft it onto my damaged one. First, I carved out just the tip of a frame. Then, after marking where it overlapped with my existing frame, I manually machined away the damaged section to create a half lap joint with the replacement tip. Doing it this way saves me from having to relocate my frame which would be tedious at best and I could still screw it up. Dialing in the perfect fit manually was the most foolproof way I could think of. In the end, the damaged section is barely noticeable but it's still a nice subtle reminder of my mistake which I'm totally okay with. To finish these up, I sanded them by hand through 400 grit on both the sidewalls and the faces. Even with my finishing passes, there were still some small machining marks that were visible. A spindle sander would have come in really handy here. Then I hung them up and hit them from every possible angle with satin spray poly. After a couple coats, I let them fully cure, sanded them with 500 grit to smooth out the surface, and hit them with a final coat. Next time, I'll probably use a brush on finish that's a little quicker to build up layer thickness. Spray poly is convenient, but it's not all that economical. Because of the earlier lessons learned here about double-sided tape, I wanted to approach the machining of the aluminum frames a little differently. The moderate amount of double-sided tape I used wasn't enough to stop these thin arms from vibrating and moving. The height to width ratios of my parts made these a bad fit for using adhesive work holding. The workaround is to machine the upper portions of the workpiece while it's still connected to the rest of my stock, and then wrap things up down low. For the aluminum, I wanted to contour down to a thick onion skin, finish the majority of the walls, then come back and clean up the area very close to the wasteboard. Conceptually, this is fine, but somehow I managed to screw this up. I like to tweak my cam settings a lot, like reducing my default retract heights or setting my lead-in feed rates to be a fixed fraction of my cutting feed rate. One time, I must have set my retract height relative to my top height, and I think this stupid option made that the case for every toolpath since then. If you're trying to change the default of one parameter, you might accidentally change the defaults of every parameter in a toolpath that you've messed with because Fusion devs gave you that option and made it really easy to accidentally click. And since then, that retract height bug has never been an issue because most of my 2D contours have started at the top of a part. But in this case, I was trying to start my contour toolpath pretty far down in a cut, 
and after retracting relative to that starting point, my cutter was still below the surface of my stock when I started moving into the next cut. And you want to know what that crash looks like? Let me show you. This was filmed on my Arlo security camera, which I use for monitoring my CNC remotely, and though there's no sound, you can imagine just how violent this must have been. That's about 400 millimeters traversed in 8 frames of video. Assuming a triangular speed profile, that's a peak velocity of 2.4 meters per second, or 5,600 inches per minute, with an acceleration of 1.5 Gs. Now, part of the reason this crash was so catastrophic was because I have my max allowable feed rates cranked up to 1,000 inches per minute. At those speeds, the steppers have a lower holding force, so when I'm rapiding, these motors can be stalled more easily or even back-driven, which is what happened here. Since this mishap, I've dropped my max feed rates in Gerbil from 1,000 inches per minute to a more reasonable 500. That should prevent my gantry from being thrown around so much in the event of a future crash. By the way, because of this mishap, I also now recommend that if people have an e-stop switch hooked up to their machine, to make sure that it kills power to both the Shapeoko and the router. You don't want to risk a one horsepower motor potentially pulling itself around the machine once the stepper motors are de-energized. Luckily, my Shapeoko was fine after this crash. No snap belts, no broken V-wheels, I didn't even break my end mill, which is impressive because I did this twice. The first time this happened, there was a gap in my recording because in motion sensing mode, the Arlo records in 40 second segments. The first crash happened between two video clips, so I was left trying to reverse engineer why my CNC was cutting all the way to the left when I came back to it. I concluded that the corner piece of my stock had come loose, jammed against my socket dust boot, and caused me to drift in the negative X direction. I even found my dust boot half out of the mounting brackets like this, so it seemed quite reasonable that the machine had sort of ratcheted itself leftward. Obviously, my forensic analysis was worthless because the failure mode would be revealed the next time I ran this program. So yeah, this crash happened twice. But once I worked through those catastrophic errors, my frames were machined out flawlessly. Third time really was the charm. By the way, I'm using the Carbide 3D 278Z single flute cutter, and I have a video with feeds and speeds for it linked below. After getting these cut out, I cleaned up all the faces on a deburring wheel that I stole from Carbide 3D. And this thing has quickly become my favorite thing to have in the shop. As someone who's never used a benchtop buffer before, seeing the way that it brought everything down to a uniform surface and rounded over edges was mind-blowing. I will never be without one of these things now. Some of the inside faces that I couldn't reach with the wheel I had to clean up by hand, but that wasn't too bad. To match the texture of my MacBook Pro though, since that's what this monitor stand would reside behind, I wanted to bead blast the surfaces. And for that, I opted for the Harbor Freight Air Eraser, which I've used before and been happy with the results, but it is super slow. If I knew I was going to be doing this more often, I would 100% invest in a cheap sandblasting cabinet and a sprayer with a larger hopper. These parts were painfully slow to do, and I lost a good amount of abrasive that ended up all over my shop. But once this was done, it looked great. I just couldn't touch it because the finish was super easy to scratch. Raw aluminum is a terrible choice for anything that's going to be handled. These frames are going to have to be anodized to lock in that surface finish. More on that process later. Now, for the spacers, if I had a lathe, this would be a piece of cake, but I don't, so the next best thing is to machine them on the CNC from flat stock. Same strategy as before, minus the crashes, bore out the through holes, machine the outer diameter, and leave an onion skin so that each spacer can distribute the cutting forces through neighboring material, come back and clean up that last millimeter to the floor, repeat until you have spacers to spare. My tool of choice here is the 102Z 8th inch 3 flute end mill. I was genuinely surprised when I got through the toolpaths without any part failures. That onion skin really was the MVP here. To clean up the spacers, I first use a countersink bit to clean up the ID. Since the ends of the spacers will be against the frames, these faces shouldn't ever be seen, so they don't really need to be perfect. In hindsight though, I could probably have bored out the ID cleanly and relied on the onion skin around the part to hold it down. Next, I snipped off the onion skin around the OD. Then I strung these up on a quarter inch bolt and sanded away the imperfections and machining marks. Now, let's touch on anodizing. It's definitely possible to DIY anodize aluminum and it's not very difficult assuming you're diligent about handling hazardous chemicals responsibly. I'll go more in depth on this subject in a future video, but essentially the only things you need are lye, sulfuric acid, a power supply, and electrodes. These can be aluminum plates, wires, rods, basically anything that will allow you to establish electrical continuity between parts and through the acid bath. But they should be compatible with the acid, don't use ferrous metals here. First, wash your parts to remove any surface contamination and give them a quick rinse in lye to strip away any existing oils and oxidation. 
When water wets out the entire surface of your part and doesn't beat up, that means the part is clean enough to anodize. Next, hang your parts and connect them to the anode of your power supply. The mechanical connection is critical here. You want positive pressure between your lead and the part to make sure electricity flows through it. Otherwise, the wire will build up an oxide layer and stop conducting current into your part. After an hour or two, depending on your power supply, your part will cease to be conductive and that means it's been successfully anodized. However, if you don't do a good job ensuring mechanical contact through your parts, the anodizing process can fail. And then, when you boil your parts to seal them, they'll basically corrode on you. My C-frames were anodized correctly. Some of the other parts I had JPL Richard run for me were not, and that's because I was the one who wired them up. Workholding for anodizing is just as important as it is in machining, and having successes and failures in the same batch really illustrated that to me. This was an excellent learning opportunity. I cleaned up the spacers that I screwed up and decided to forego re-anodizing them because I was impatient. I wanted to finish this project ASAP. But when it came time to do final assembly, I realized that my quarter inch dowels were a few thou oversized, and I didn't have enough tolerance in my spacers to slide them over the dowel. So I ground down my aluminum rods on the deburring wheel until they were under 0.249 inches in diameter. Next time, the spacers will be made with an ID that's a few thou oversized. With everything sliding together smoothly but snugly, I squeezed a dab of E6000 into my aluminum frames and sandwiched my walnut between them. My thought was that as a flexible adhesive, E6000 would be better suited to handling a thou or two of thermal and humidity driven expansion and contraction, but it turned out to be not that great a fit. These holes that I applied adhesive in had really poor exposure to the atmosphere, so the diffusion rate of the solvent or whatever it is in the glue that prevents it from curing in the tube is really slow. My frames still came apart after 24 hours, I ended up having to let them sit for closer to 72 hours. If I were to do this again, I would use 5 minute epoxy and also grind in a few grooves in the dowels for extra holding strength. After it was all said and done though, I stuck a few rubber feet on the bottom and put my monitor stand to use. With the weight of the monitor that I have, there's a degree or two of sag in the frame, but I'm still fairly confident that it'll hold up in the long run. I knew that this was a risk and I had originally thought about reversing the rear frame so that the structure wouldn't be cantilevered or even making the back frame a continuous loop, but the lack of front to back symmetry here would have bugged me a little too much. As is, I'm pretty happy with how everything turned out. The main thing I wanted to get out of this project was to end up with something that looked good. The extra desk space helps too, but let's be real, it took me 6 months to decide I needed a monitor stand, I'm probably never going to get my life in perfect order. No, the important part is that I made something I'm proud to show off. Putting in the time to sand through the grits to get a smooth coat of polyurethane on my frames, to evenly bead blast the aluminum, and seeing everything come together despite bungling multiple steps, that's the payoff that matters. I want to thank you all very much for watching, and I'll be back soon with more CNC projects and DIY mayhem.